is Kina Middlesdorf, um, and today for my nurse theory presentation, I'm going to talk to you about the Roy adaptation model. First, let's talk about who um, Castilla Roy is. She was born in October 14, 1939, in Los Angeles, California. She completed her bachelor's degree in nursing in 1963 at Mount St. Mary's College. She later completed her master's degree in sociology in 1973 and her doctorate degree in sociology in 1977 at the University of California. Roy became interested in adaptation after observing how children adapted to medical care and changes while working as a pediatric nurse. And she later presented her model as a conceptual framework for the nursing at Mount St. Mary's College in 1968. So what is adaptation? Adaptation, according to Tabor's um, dictionary, is the adjustment of an organism to a change in internal or external conditions or circumstances. And Roy defines adaptation as the process and outcome whereby thinking and feeling persons as individuals in or groups use conscious awareness and choice to create human and environmental integration. So let's take a closer look at the actual model. Roy's adaptation model, um, this is a great visual of it. First, um, you're going to look at the stimuli. So what's actually affecting the patient or the situation? So first, Roy's adaptation model was derived from a combination of Helson's adaptation theory and Rappaport's definition of system. The model was further developed with concepts and other theories um, from several other theorists. Roy's adaptation model focuses on adaptation of the person, whereby the person, health, nursing, and the environment are all interrelated. So there's three classes of stimuli, that's what we start with. The first is focal stimuli, which is the individual. Then there's contextual stimuli, which is all other stimuli that affects the individual. And then there's residu residual stimuli, and that's going to be the environmental stimuli or factors. So once the input occurs, um, it's going to be affected, it's going to affect four adaptive modes, which will then affect coping processes. So let's look at the four adaptive modes. The first mode is the physiological, physical adaptive mode, which is concerned with how humans interact with the environment to meet basic needs such as oxygenation, um, nutrition, protection, elimination, and activity and rest. The second mode, which you can see right here, is the self-concept mode. It's a group identity adaptive mode, which concerns who is the person and how are they interacting in society. It also concerns the individual as a physical self and as the personal self. The third mode right here is the role function mode and that's going to look at the person as um, how they behave towards another person. The last mode um, is the interdependence adaptive mode which concerns the interaction of the person in society and then how that person's affected um, with their significant other and then any other support system. So once the stimuli occurs and it, it affects all these modes and it can affect them all at the same time, coping processes are going to occur and then there's going to be a response. Um, that response is going to create a behavior and it's either going to be an effective response or it's going to be fully adaptive. So a summary of the model, first the stimulation is going to occur, there's going to be an, a, the um, effect on the adaptive modes, so the physiological, physical, the self-concept, group identity, role function, and interdependence, and then a behavioral response will occur. And that's either going to be an adaptive response or an ineffective response. Rory also created this model, and this is looking at the person as an adaptive system. So as you can see, let me go back a bit.
There we go. Um, as you can see, input is going to occur, and there's going to be a stimuli, which is that adaptation level. There's going to be coping mechanisms and regulator, regulator cognator, which is going to be the control process of so how the patient or person is going to respond. Um, then the effectors are all those modes we talked about. Then there's going to be an output created, which will be the adaptive and ineffective responses. And then feedback will occur, and that process is going to start um, all over. So let's look at the key points. Adaptation should be the goal of the nurse. The person is going to be the adaptive system. The environment will be the stimuli or whatever is going to affect that response. The health is going to be the outcome of adaptation. And the nursing is going to be geared towards promoting adaptation um, and health. Rory also created six steps in the nursing process. Um, and this is going to go through how a patient can actually um, adapt. So first, the first step is to assess the behaviors manifested from the four adaptive modes. The second step is going to assess the stimuli for those behaviors and categorize them as the focal, contextual, or residual stimuli. The third step, you're going to make a statement or nursing diagnoses of the person's adaptive state. So the nurse can use these steps to go through this process and kind of see how the patient's going to respond. The fourth step is to set goals to promote adaptation. The fifth step, you're going to implement interventions aimed at managing the stimuli to promote adaptation. And then the last step, you want to evaluate. So evaluate whether the adaptive group or goals um, have been met. With this process, the nurse can aid in the patient's adaptation process by adding input and feedback to make adaptation easier and promote positive outcomes. So I want to take a look at a couple of articles um, that's going to actually place this theory into practice. Um, Roy Ada Roy's adaptation model um, can be used in a lot of uh, research, and it has been. So let's take a look at a few. The first one um, this article was the effect of treatment education based on the Rory adaptation model on adjustment of hemodialysis patients. So according to this study by Victon and Kiribakak, the Rory adaptation model was used with a group of dialysis patients to evaluate them using four modes according to the model. Each patient was evaluated using the physiological adaptive mode, the self-concept adaptive mode, the role function adaptive mode, and the interdependence adaptive mode. At the end of the study, it was found that the dialysis patient had improvements in physiological, psychological, and social adjustments after training took place. So they were able to study how these patients responded using the Roy adaptation model or mode. Um, let's look at one more article. And this is the utilization of music therapy in palliative and hospice care, and it's an integrative review. So according to this study by Bowers and Wetzel, the Rory adaptation model um, was used as a conceptual framework for a literature review about music therapy effect on hospice and palliative care patients. This study reviewed the response that these patients um, related to fear, anxiety, pain, depression, and quality of life, primarily. And this study was a perfect example of how Roy's adaptation model can act as a tool for reviewing related to specific ideals. And this can be anything, um, but they just specifically looked at those items. The conclusion of this article uh, review supported the use of the gift of music to aid in symptom management and quality of life improvement. So as you can see, Roy's adaptation model can be used to, for research um, and it can further help with patient care. So let's talk about why this theory was chosen for the ICU. This theory was chosen as an appropriate model for the ICU 
um, in the intensive care unit because adaptation is a continuous process for both the nurse and the patient in any situation. There's a lot of difficult situations that occur in the intensive care unit, such as death, end of life, um, there's a lot of critical procedures, and there's cardiopulmonary arrest. The um, Rory Adaptation Model can be used as a quick guide to kind of go through those processes and make sure that everything is done for the patient that's going to help them adapt during these situations. If critical care nurses can fully understand this process, they can ensure appropriate promotion of adaptation for positive patient care outcomes. So next, I want to go through a case study and I want to talk specifically about how the patient and this can be used for the nurse as well. The patient's adaptation process is focused on critical event or procedure where the nurse um, has an adaptation process as well and it's focused on the event and adapting quickly to fully meet the needs of the patient. So let's talk about a case study. You have a patient um, just arrived to the unit post motor vehicle crash. The patient is intubated and has several injuries including a subdural hematoma, fractured femur, and several broken ribs. You arrive in your patient's room to assess the current situation and priorities. Following the Roy's six-step nursing process, we're going to go through all of these steps. So first, you want to assess the behavior manifested using the four adaptive modes. So you recognize um, you will need to ensure your patient has adequate oxygen and ventilation on the ventilator. You want to provide adequate rest, activity, nutrition for healing, and you want to make sure you have adequate urine output and protection from any outlying factors that um, will require this continuous monitoring. You also recognize that provided support from the family and nursing staff is necessary for improving the patient's outcome. Without these necessary behaviors, the patient may be compromised. So you assess the patient and determine that all necessary items are in place at the current time. So next we'll look at that second step. You want to assess the stimuli for those behaviors and categorize them. So there are um, stimuli that are going to affect this process. The focal stimuli may include your patient's response to therapy or their cooperation during needed procedures. The contextual stimuli may include other factors that affect your patient, such as obscure lab work, bleeding at incision sites, or insufficient IV access. And then the final residual stimuli is environmental, and it may include the room temperature, lighting, noise, or bed location. So after assessing your patient, um, you see that the current stimuli um, you determine that the patient needs more pain medication and that's necessary for patient comfort. You want to also minimize noise and visitors, have low lighting, and have blood pressure control to help ensure the ICP is not elevated. So looking at the third step, you want to make a statement or a nursing diagnosis. And currently you determine that your patient is progressing well and all items are in place to ensure stability. You do determine that your patient um, is at risk for increased ICP um, due to the subdural hematoma and you also want to watch for bleeding since it was a motor vehicle crash. You want to make sure that your patient again has adequate ventilation and oxygenation while on the ventilator. So setting some goals to promote adaptation. You set several goals for your patient's daily progress. For today's goals, you decide to focus on pain control, blood pressure management, and minimal sedation for neurological evaluation and progression to spontaneous breathing trial in the AM. You also have a goal to provide family support during this difficult time. You want to make sure that you're there for the patient and you set goals for the family as well. Looking at the fifth step in Roy's process, you want to implement interventions aimed at managing the stimuli to promote adaptation. So you implement your pain control measures by giving four milligrams of morphine IV push. You do have labetalol PRN to maintain your blood pressure. You want to keep your systolic less than 160. 
and you are monitoring your patient's neurological status with every hour neurochecks. You also have your patient on minimal ventilator settings. The last step, you want to evaluate whether the adaptive goals have been met. So with continuous evaluation, and this is going to be a continuous process, you determine that your patient's pain is currently under control, the blood pressure is within acceptable range, and the neurological exams are appropriate. Ventilator settings are minimal for progression to spontaneous breathing trial and extubation. You also determine that environmental factors are adequate for promoting healing. But also keep in mind um, that this ROI adaptation model can also be flipped to ensure proper adaptation of nursing staff during emergency situations. So next, let's take a look at critiquing the ROI adaptation model. We're going to look at, was it logical, is it consistent, similar, and is it supported by past research? The ROI adaptation model is logical and it's very easy to follow. It can be used in pretty much any nursing situation. It's very consistent. This model is used in um, adaptation scenario to evaluate the situation. And the ROI six-step process is very similar to the nursing process. We always want to have that step-by-step -step, um, with that end evaluation. The ROI adaptation model is also supported by past research. Um, it was derived from the combination of Helson's adaptation theory and Rappaport's definition of system. I want to thank you for um, taking the time to listen to the review on the ROI adaptation model. And you can um, see these references for further input on the ROI adaptation model. Um, and please use it in any nursing care process just to make for best patient care outcomes. Thank you.